And my name is Ariel Duranger. My full name is Ariel Tsekwe, which means Thunder Woman. And my mom always makes this joke that she named me properly because I have a very big mouth. <laughs> so, um, in order for you to really get an understanding of the impacts that the First Nations in the region are feeling, I want to sort of welcome you in to get an understanding of who we are uh, first off and firsthand, because what we are up against is, is really a David and Goliath story. So who are the ACFN? ACFN being the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. And I really like to use this quote uh, that was said by our former Chief Archie Cyprian. The land is the essence of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation culture, values, and spirituality. In fact, the name Dene Sutlene, which is our traditional name, Dene Sutlene, for us it's the Kaital Dene Sutlene, is the people of the land, and particularly the people of the willow, which is representative of the Athabasca Delta itself. Our cultures and value are so intrinsically linked to the ecosystems and the places where we exist. The ACFN has a very, you know, very, very simple vision and mission that we want to lead a proud, culturally unified and independent First Nation. And we want to foster growth and progress for our members by providing and maintaining opportunities with respect for land, water and culture. And that's simply not happening. Now, you have to think about the fact that where we are come from, even our namesake, Dene Sutlene, Kai Tal Dene Sutlene, we come from the land. It is not just some simple name that is bestowed upon us, but it is who we are. As human beings, we often identify with our places of being and where we've come from. If you're Irish, you're from Ireland. If you're Scottish, you're from Scotland. If you're English, you're from England, and so on and so forth. These places of being help us identify our ancestral roots. And they're still there for many of you. For us, if the Athabasca is destroyed, then we are destroyed along with it. When those places no longer exist, the people that identify with those places also no longer exist. Our nation and our culture continues to run strong. It's not uncommon to have 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds take down a moose to help prepare it and share it amongst the community members. Our children learn their culture, their language, and their identity from the day they're born to the day that they die, and they pass it on to the future generations. Our culture and identity was guaranteed to us through treaties. Now treaties in Canada where there was 11 numbered treaties signed in Canada and various other peace and friendship treaties but our nation signed what is known as treaty number eight and treaty number eight was entered into in 1899 and these treaties guaranteed to us rights including hunting trapping gathering and fishing rights and access to the lands to to continue to practice those as long as the sun shines and the rivers flow now a lot of times people think about treaties as these really pr almost like pre-civilization documents, something that are antiquated and have no bearing in today in modern society. But I want to give you an understanding of how that's simply not true. Our treaty was signed in 1899. My grandfather, who I knew and loved, was born in 1898. This is not some document that holds no bearing or relevance to me in my life. This is something that was signed in the lifetime of my grandfather. This is something that still holds relevance today because my people continue to access our cultural lands for hunting, fishing, trapping, and cultural rights. And these are not recreational rights. These are a part of our identity and who we are. They're not simply some sort of you know, special right that we have. It is a part of our identity. Being a part of the land is who we are. From a very young age, we're taught that the the eagles and the ducks and the fish and the moose and the caribou and the bison and the trees and the medicines are our ancestors, they're our cousins, they're our brothers, they're our sisters. That the water is what nourishes us and brings us life. Father Sun, Mother Earth, Grandmother Moon, even the mountains are our ancestors because they hold the knowledge that helped us to become who we are as human beings as caretakers of this land. So, 
it's not just us that recognizes and affirms that our rights are actually unique. The Canadian Constitution was amended in 1982 to further protect and recognize the rights outlined within treaty. And those rights are not to be uh, negated by any other laws in Canada. This is in the Canadian Constitution. This is recognized in Canadian law. Our treaties, our nation-to-nation -nation agreements. And it's really important to understand how, that our people fought very hard for this. And they fought very hard for this because of the importance that it really holds in protecting and ensuring that we are who we are as long as the sun shines and the rivers flow. So, you know, these are, these are not pictures from a long time ago. These are recent pictures from our communities where our culture and our identity continues to hold and run strong from the youngest to the oldest. Our culture and identity is incredibly important. Our, the food sources, our traditional food sources, this is a young girl at a, at a fishing rack. Fish is a huge part of our community. It's the central food of our community, and it's one of the ones that's being threatened most adversely by the development. I really like this last picture that I put up here because it, it's, you know, it's not that old. It's from a couple years ago from a culture camp where we really taught the young people about the importance of doing what Gar said, using every bit of nature. You know, we built our camping stove. Our camping stove was built from the trees around us. Uh, and we cooked all of our meals on it. In the side there, we, we uh, sliced and prepared meat. We had the children make fish nets, put out the fish nets, bring in the fish nets, gut and clean the fish. We had ducks, we had all sorts of animals. We did storytelling, t cultural teachings, and it was a time for the children to bring, get reconnected and reacquainted with the land so that they could, too, then pass that information on to future generations. And keeping our culture alive is an important part of Indigenous peoples' culture and values. Our traditional territory spans uh, across multiple regions, but uh, the bulk of it is in Alberta for the ACFN. This is just for ACFN. This is not Treaty 8. But the dark line, that dark area, is critical to our people. Those are the areas we utilize the most. The lower areas with the yellow in the bulk is areas that our people go to, but are not as utilized by our members. In the yellow region on the bottom, right about, I'm gonna go over here. Through this region right here, that's the heart of the tar sands. Now, to give you an understanding a little bit more, here's an aerial shot. Aerial shot. I'm trying to be, fun. trying to be funny. <laughs> Um, maybe you can't see this very well, but basically down at the bottom, it says tailings ponds. And that little line that squiggles up through there is the Athabasca River system. And Fort Chippewan is the township where most of the members of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation live, which is in the mouth of Lake Athabasca. The tailings ponds sit precariously close to the Athabasca River system. Now, you can imagine the types of problems that that is creating for our, our people. That river system is not just a, simply a river system. It is a roadway. It is the lifeline of our community. It is a flying community for Chippewa. You either fly in or you boat up the river. So the river is also a ri roadway. Or you, um, you wait till the winter when the rivers freeze over and you drive over top of them. Not on the river, but a series of roadways through there. And that's the only way in and out, which is what causes the cost of food to be so high. Right now, our community and our traditional territory is at odds with this. Does anyone know what this is? This is tar sands. This is what we're all after. We're after this dirty pile of mud. And it's become more valuable than human life, our culture, our values, or laws, such as the Canadian Constitution. Alberta's tar sands, just to give you an idea for area, this is the area that, it, that they currently exist. There are three key areas in Alberta. There's the Athabasca region, where my people are from, which is the big giant blob. There's the one lower, which is the Cold Lake region, where Crystal Lehman, who was on the previous half of this tour, is from. And there's the Peace River region. All of these communities and all the First Nations in this region are feeling the exact same impacts. And many of these nations are also taking their own individual stands. And I don't want to, <coughs> to you all think that we're, there's not people fighting this. People are fighting it everywhere. 
Now, I'd just really like to share this quote from uh, Dr. David Schindler, who is an ecology professor at the U of A, who says, there's nothing on this planet that compares with the destruction going on there. If there were a global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be a clear winner. And he's absolutely right. When you talk about what are they actually doing, they're scraping off the surface of the boreal forest. They're scraping away the traditional territories of the ACFN and many other First Nations. They're scraping away the critical habitat for species, and they refer to all of this as overburden, because it is a burden for them to do this in order to access this land. We like to call overburden boreal forests. Since operations have begun, more than 1.4 billion tons of what industry calls overburden have been removed. That's more dirt than the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramids of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. That's why Pr Prime Minister Harper says this is a project of epic proportions. Now the tailings ponds is a really big issue. You know, you could see the tailings ponds from outer space in that uh, aerial photo, um, satellite photo that I showed you. And what's really scary is the amount of water we are giving to industry to turn into toxic tailings ponds. The annual license oil sands withdrawals are the equivalent to a city of three million. Now I named the three different regions of tar sands development. In the Beaver Lake Cree region and the Cold Lake tar sands region, the communities in there are, are often on boil water advisories. The communities in the Peace Delta region, where my friend Melina Labukon Massimo is from, don't have running water. In communities in my region, there's a community called the Fort Mackay First Nation that lives literally in the heart of the tar sands. They are surrounded by development that they can't, are often, they often cannot even bathe in their water without having chemical burns on their skin. Their rights of these industries are taking precedence and priorities, not over just protecting fisheries and rivers, but human rights to water. And the water quality impacts are poorly understood. They've never done the proper monitoring. They've never done baseline studies. What's happening in, re in the region, when we say the waters are being contaminated, government simply says, well, how do you have proof? And we don't, because there are no baselines. There are nothing to compare the current data with, and government stands by their conviction that the, natural con that the levels of contamination in the Athabasca River system are natural. Now, um, Garth talked a little bit about SAG-D, or in situ. Now, this is what it actually looks like. You know, they stick these pipes. It's very similar to fracking. They superheat the ground and then they suck it back up. And they call this environmentally benign because it looks so nice up top. It's so environmentally benign, in fact, that the Alberta government doesn't think that it needs to have a public review process. So it doesn't. SAG-D has a very large environmental footprint. Looking at the images, you see the fragmentation of the boreal forest. But to give you a little bit far back, even better understanding, this is the region around Fort McMurray. Um, and this is what it looks like now, and this is the footprint of uh, existing leases and what they will result in. I don't think any caribou are going to get through that. I don't think any bison are going to get through that. The big white chunk is the open pit mines. You talk about the fragmentation, you talk about the, the migratory birds. In 2008, 1,606 migratory birds on their way up through the region wanted to stop to water. They landed in a tailings pond instead of open water, and they all perished and died, every single last one of them. This has serious implications on the abilities of species survival, let alone the First Nations who rely on those species to feed their children and feed their families and continue practicing their cultural identities and who they are. By destroying these ecosystems and these species, you are destroying the very thread of who our people ha are and have always been. And even I pull back even a little bit more. You look at all the different lease sites. These are all been already sold out. Little dot, that's Fort McMurray. There's a city in there somewhere. You go a little bit further north up there, you start to get into the traditional territory of the ACFN. In there, there are First Nations communities that exist right in the middle of all of this. And on this map, if you could actually read it, it's every major oil and gas company from across the globe. This is not a Canadian issue. This is not a US issue. This is a global issue. 
I stated about the migratory pattern disruptions, but that is leading, what all these projects are contributing to are contamination of traditional food sources for indigenous people who rely on these food sources. And Sun, Suncor did a study on some meat that they captured, or moose that they captured because the people had been complaining and found that arsenic levels were 453 times higher than they should be in moose. Well, this obviously prompted the Alberta government to get a little scared, so they did their own study and said, oh no, Suncor got it wrong, they're only 17 to 33 times higher. And by the way, all of your wild meat might be contaminated. So of course, the community got very frightened by this and did their own independent study and hoped that they might, these studies might be wrong. But in fact, they weren't only right, but it wasn't just arsenic, it was mercury, it was polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and it wasn't just found in the moose, but it was also in the fish and the waterfowl and the muskrats and the beavers. All of our traditional food is being contaminated. Just recently, well, I'll talk about this, this is leading to cancers in the communities. Cancers that are so rare that they should only be seen in one in 100,000, and yet we're seeing them in a community of 1,200. Six cases of confirmed rare for forms of bile duct cancer, in fact. And this study was from a long time ago, which said, yes, there are elevated levels of cancer, but at the end of this study, the government said, however, First Nations people live high-risk lifestyles, and therefore, we can't draw any conclusions that it's related to the contamination of anything. Our community has recently done their own study, and the, it it's not going to be released yet, but I've saw, seen some preliminary data just this week on this part of the sewer, and what's come out is that uh, they did studies and found that levels of toxic contaminant in all of our traditional foods is at a really seriously threatening rate, not just to children, but to, to adults and children alike. Selenium, mercury, hydrocarbons are causing and po posing serious risks to the health of the First Nations. 94 members of the community participated in that study, and of those 94 members, 22 of them had cancers, and of those 22, there were 27 occurrences of cancers. That's almost, a, like that's, that's a quarter of the participants had cancer. That's one in four people had cancer. Obviously, the impacts of development go far beyond the environment. And that's what's not being taken into consideration. The ecological and the human health impacts of these projects are not being calculated into it. And again, what we're seeing is governments just trying to wash it all over and say nothing's wrong, especially, you know, oh, you know what? We're, this, see the boreal forest? It's all, you, we're gonna fix that. We're gonna put it all back and then we're gonna make it just as beautiful as the way it was before through reclamation technologies that are fantastic. You know, we have the way. This is equivalent land use capacity. Do you think you're gonna find moose here? Do you think you're gonna find caribou or bison or any of the biodiversity? Do you think that the migratory birds are gonna wanna stop here? And to date, only 0.02% of all tar sands operations have been certified as reclaimed. It's taken them 50 years to reclaim a total of one square kilometer. So 50 years, how many generations of culture and land rights will be lost? You can't mitigate the impacts to our rights if generations, multiple generations, lose that access to who we are and our identities. So our First Nations rights, we are utilizing them as a platform to try and challenge big corporations and government. We have sued Shell in 2011 for failure to live up to their past agreements. And our chief stated that the fate of our communities and our river is at stake and we are in the crosshairs of Shell's plans to aggressively expand tar sands in our traditional territory. We have utilized our treaty rights alleging that the province and the government and the energy giant Shell have failed to adequately consult with our nation and they have violated our treaty rights. In this case, we lost. Shell's Jack Pine Mine was ultimately approved even though they found that it would have significant adverse environmental effects on wetlands, traditional plant potentials, wetland reliant species, migratory birds, and biodiversity, and that it would also contribute to um, the loss of Aboriginal traditional land use, rights, and culture, yet they said it was in the public's interest, so let's just forget about the breaching of all those various laws. It also would require the mining out of 21 kilometers of one of the river systems that our community also relies on. But First Nations rights are not simply something that can be ignored. 
They have become the last remaining stronghold for environmental protection in Canada because of something called an omnibus bill, C-45, which was at the center of the I don't know more up, uh, movement in 2012. The omnibus bills were supposed to be budget bills, but they snuck in gutting and sweeping legislat legislative changes to environmental acts, most notably the Navigable Waters Act, which removed the protection of two point which decreased the protection of lakes and rivers from 2.5 million lakes and rivers being protected to only 62, and nine, 62 rivers and 93 lakes. We lost over the protection of over 99% of the lakes and rivers in Canada. That left a lot of room for industry to continue to forge forward full steam ahead. There were also numerous changes to the National Energy Board, the Fisheries Act, the Species at Risk Act, basically anything that was in the way of industry being able to continue status as quo, they gutted it. And we found that there was actually documentation that the, these industries lobbied the government to make the very changes that they did. However, they cannot destroy our treaty rights. Nothing can preclude or negate those rights. And so our rights hold paramount. And our rights have become the key to challenging the development and the status quo of the development. Our nation has decided to draw a very specific line that red border and that red line right there, where there are currently no projects, there are no tar sands there, but there are many projects being proposed by Shell, BP, Koch Brothers, Exxon, and a company called Tech. They all have projects in that region. And we have said, nope, enough is enough. We do not want any projects there and we will hold the line and we will challenge any projects that are being proposed in that region because they will violate our treaty rights, they will destroy our ability to access our cultural lands, the biodiversity, and everything that makes us Dene Sutlene people. It will contribute to the cultural genocide of our people. And so we have done everything we can. We've utilized this line in responses to their caribou and bison recovery strategies because these species are in serious decline. They have developed something called the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, which basically states that the same area that we say is culturally significant and necessary for the survival of species is a pr bitumen priority use area. So we have filed for a statutory review of the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan and we are currently uh, challenging the recent decision on the Jack Pine Mine stating that the government is in breach of its own laws and legislation and ultimately in, in severe breach of the treaty number eight and the rights of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. These cases will likely end up in the Supreme Court of Canada, and we are willing to hold the line and challenge any other projects that also plan or, or achieve approvals in this region. And so I leave you with this last quote, and I always, <laughs> I always say it's really narcissistic of me to put a picture of myself up, but uh, I like the quote, and it says, our people and our Mother Earth can no longer afford to be economic hostages in the race to industrialize our homelands. Because you have to understand there are many other nations in the region that they take the money that's being handed to them because they feel as though they have no other choice. Our communities are some of the most impoverished communities in the world, many living in third world conditions like I stated earlier, and sometimes it's hard to pass up the money when you have starving members. But we can no longer afford to be economic hostages in the race to industrialize our homelands. It's time for our people to rise up and take back our role as caretakers and stewards of the land. And now, I just want to leave you with one other message on that note. That, you know, my mom always says, and I don't know how to say this nicely, but the white people in North America are the most oppressed. They lost their way from their mother a long time ago. They've forgotten their roles as stewards and caretakers of the lands. And so when I say it's time for our people to rise up, we all have that ability to rise up. We all have that connection to the mother. Just because we have, you are, you've become so disconnected doesn't mean you can't find your way back. You know, I call myself a half a generation removed from the land because I was privileged enough to be able to live on the land for the first half of my life. I now live in the cities. And my choice to live in the city is not easy. It comes from the fact that my traditional territory is so contaminated and the risks are so great to live there. When I had a choice to move 
to the community for Chipewan, I talked it over with my family and my daughter, who was 12 at the time, looked at me and said to me, Mom, are you crazy? I don't want to get cancer and die. And so it's a struggle for me to make those choices, to keep my children away from that. And every time we go home and every time I eat that fish and every time I eat that meat, I wonder what I'm putting in my body. But it is a part of who I am and so I pray and I hope that my children will know what it means to be Dene Sutlene and that they will have the opportunities to know that connection to the land. And so I ask that we all think about our roles as children of Mother Earth and reclaiming that role and responsibility and moving forward to creating a better tomorrow, not just for my people, but for all of us because another world is possible and we can do it. And so I thank you, Masicho, thank you.